Stephen can be spelled so many different ways. Yeah. yeah. You can be Stefan. Well, that's the Italian version. Esteban in Spanish. Etienne. So it's one of those old romances. Tell us time. All right, boss. Entrepreneurship uh, and had another BBT program like we have here at, uh, at Jesuit. Uh, Stephen has written a number of books uh, explaining postmodernism, uh, is one. Uh, Nietzsche and the Nazis, another good one, and there's several others. And he's also uh, uh, been published in a number of uh, academic journals and, and things too, like the uh, like Wall Street Journal. And I think that's enough to give you a good idea of uh, our speaker's background. So here's uh, Stephen Hicks to speak on The Virtuous Entrepreneur. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Ed, for uh, inviting me and for uh, that introduction. I want to start by making the claim that we live in a new entrepreneurial world. I see most of you are students and I'm going to take you guys as my primary audience for this evening. Uh, the world that you are going to enter into into your professional life is unlike the world of much of the 20th century and certainly the world of business of most of human history. Let me give you a couple of indicators up front to tell you what I mean. If you think about the job market, as I know you're thinking about it, uh, the fact is that the number of people who are working at large, mature corporations is declining, and it has been declining significantly for the last 30 years. It peaked in the middle part of the 20th century, and then it's been on a slow decline. Another indication of that is if you look at Fortune 500 companies, you take the top 500 corporations in the United States, now, and then you go back 30 years. The number of corporations that were on the Fortune 500 company, uh, for Fortune 500 list 30 years ago, it's only a minority of them that are still on Fortune 500 list. That is to say, the majority of the companies that are on the Fortune 500 list now were entrepreneurial startups in your lifetime, and that trend is continuing. If you think about the uh, demand side, right, so to speak, one very interesting uh, demographic trend uh, focusing on young people like you, as they started doing surveys back in the 60s, asking people while they were in university, what are your plans for your career once you graduate? Do you plan to go to work for an existing business? Or do you plan, uh, the other option was, to start your own business right at some point? In the mid-1960s, 1965, the number of people who said that their ideal was to go to work for a mature organization, preferably a large corporation, was 95%. Only 5% of students indicated that they were thinking seriously about starting their own business in the mid-1960s. Same survey is done every 10 years to develop a longitudinal study. If you plug into the numbers in 1985, the number of students thinking seriously about entrepreneurship has risen to about 20%. That is a fourfold increase in 20 years. And the last numbers that I've seen from 2005, uh, in, in, sorry, 2000, yes, 2005, indicate that almost 50% of your generation, right, of students is thinking seriously about entrepreneurship. The actual, the actual number was 48%. Now that is a dramatic shift right, over my lifetime, and it is one indication. Now another indicator is a more theoretical indicator. Uh, I am a philosopher by profession, but I do philosophy of economics as one of my areas, and so I try to keep tabs on what the economists are doing. 
And there's been a dramatic shift in the way economists are starting to think about what they do, that is to say, to study the economy, to study business right, and so forth. And for most of the 20th century, economists ignored entrepreneurs. Right? What they were interested in was more impersonal macroeconomic models, lots of supply and demand charts. And entrepreneurship was not something that fit the equation. Right? Entrepreneurs are people who do innovative things. They disrupt things. Right? And so entrepreneurs are always taking things away from equilibrium. And what the economists wanted in their models was to strive for the equilibrium, right? whatever that was. So entrepreneurs were seen as the outliers and uh, just largely bracketed right, and set aside. But what has started to happen is, in the last 15 years especially, professional economists are saying we have to take entrepreneurship seriously as a foundational business and economic phenomenon. We have to recast, now this is still a minority movement, but it's a growing minority movement within economics, uh, taking seriously entrepreneurship as a phenomenon. Now my other field is business ethics, and that's where I'm going to be mostly speaking from tonight. Uh, in business ethics, we also, uh, business ethics is a bit of a laggard here, but in the last five years or so, there's a significantly increasing number of us who are interested in entrepreneurship and its connection to business ethics. So that's where I want to focus on tonight. Now, first question, what does entrepreneurship have to do with uh, ethics? Well, let me uh, indicate it by coming at it from the perspective of three titans of American business. I don't know if you know J.P. Morgan, late 19th century, early 20th century, giant in the banking field and what we would now call uh, you know, a, a titan of industry, but also a venture capitalist. And at one of the, the points where he was uh, before Senate hearings talking about some sort of a banking crisis that was going on, and he was asked by one of the senators, right, whether money, Right, which is what bankers and venture capitalists are interested in, uh, only, so to speak, goes to people who already have money, and why does he uh, only loan money to rich people? And he denied that, and what he said was something very interesting. Quote, he said, no, sir, the first thing is character. And he continued, if someone he couldn't trust asked for funding, he wouldn't make the loan even if he had all the bonds in Christendom. All right, the important point here is, this is the richest guy, I don't know, if, uh, that might not be true. One of the top five richest guys, right, at this point here saying the most important thing that he looks for is character, right? And that's a big part of his success, is judging the character, right, of people. Now we fast forward 50 years, Georges Doriette, he's a French immigrant, but he comes to the United States and he's widely seen as one of the founders of the field of venture capital. We're now comfortable with venture capital as an institutional force, but that was something that was developed over the course of the 20th century. And uh, one of the most successful ones in the middle part of the 20th century, and people are asking why was he so successful right at doing so, and there's uh, an anecdote here. He spends most of his time talking to people who bring him investments. He says he's considered no less than 5,000 of them since 1946. He's considered by friends and critics alike as a brilliant judge of character. But he has to be, he explains. When someone comes with an idea that's never been tried, the only way you can judge is by the kind of man you're dealing with. Okay. All right, fast forward another 50 years to this gentleman here, Kevin O'Connor. My Center for Ethics and Entrepreneurship, one of the things we do is we publish a newsletter that features interviews with uh, successful entrepreneurs. I interviewed uh, Kevin O'Connor out in California. He's now a venture capitalist, but he made his uh, first big money in, uh, in a, number of venture, a number of entrepreneurial ventures that uh, he would work at them for five years and then sell them for $50, $60 million or so and then turn that money into other adventures. Uh, you know his work through the internet because most of the time when you click on a page, if there's advertising that loads up, you'll get that annoying little thing that says uh, 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 ad clicks, right, waiting for. Right? He was the, one of the founders of DoubleClick, and that was a company that he grew into the first powerhouse internet advertising agency, and they sold out to a company that eventually sold out to Google for $1.5 billion. So I was interviewing him on what made him successful, what his business ideas, right, and so forth. And now that he himself is a venture capitalist, he's on the other side of the equation, what does he look for when he is looking to fund various entrepreneurial ventures? And he says, I look at three things. Have they found a big problem 
in a big market, think big, have they solved the problem in what I believe to be the most effective way, and are they able to pull it off? Right? Are they smart? Are they aggressive? Are they honest and hardworking? Right? And then afterward he said, and really it's the latter thing that's the most important thing, right? that list of character traits. So the point is, uh, now over a century of business titans, all of them saying the most important thing in terms of business success is character. Right? So what is uh, character? Right, what character makes someone an entrepreneur? What character are VCs and other investors looking for? And then for myself, right, each of us individually, right, what do I want to get out of life? What are my goals? And what must my character be to be the kind of person who can succeed in the hopefully big goals that I'm setting for myself? Now, all of that's to come at it from the business side. Right? We recognize the importance of character there. But if we ask the same question about character from the ethics side, then we start asking questions like, what is it to be an admirable person? Right? Or what kinds of character traits are morally good, right? morally admirable, right? and so forth? And ethics, of course, is uh, very controversial. Uh, and the issues are complicated and so forth. But what I want to do today is argue that what good ethics will say is good character and what successful people in business will say are good character traits that enable people to succeed in business amount to the same thing. There's a very tight integration right, between those two lists of things. So uh, how does that work out? And I want to uh, take up explicitly, right, after I talk a little bit further, what's called in business ethics the separation thesis. And that's the idea that in some sense what it takes to be successful in business and what it takes to be considered successful morally, to be a good person morally, to be a good person in business, are different things, or often in conflict with each other things. That's the separation thesis. I want to argue that that thesis is wrong. All right, so I want to uh, tell you three short stories about three young women, all fictional. I just made these stories up to illustrate a point, bring uh, abstract ethics down to cause. So here's Carly's story. Carly uh, went to university, she majored in business, she studied hard, she was pretty smart. After she graduated, uh, she went to work for an established business. She really wanted to become an entrepreneur, but she didn't have enough experience and she didn't have enough money saved up in order to be able to do so. So while she was working her job at the corporation, she continued to work on her business plan to save up her money. And then after a couple of years, she took the entrepreneurial plunge. She worked her tail off for a few years built up her business successfully, and then was able to sell it for $10 million to another firm. And she now uh, takes the $10 million, she got married, started her family, she's building her dream house, and she's managing her portfolio of investments. All right, that's Carly's story. Now, question, is Carly admirable? Is Carly inspiring? Evaluative terms. All right, let me tell you another story. This is Tanya's story. Tanya also went to college, studied finance, and then after graduating went to work in a financial institution. Uh, the, uh, she's a smart young woman, and uh, while working at this financial institution, she discovered a flaw in uh, its funds routing procedures, and that enabled her to divert $10 million of the financial institution's money to some offshore bank accounts, had them bounced around from bank account to bank account in the Caribbean and uh, Switzerland and various other places, and covered her tracks very nicely. And uh, then after the scandal died down and the perpetrator was not caught, a year later she retired and she's now living in luxury somewhere in Europe. So she scammed $10 million and got away with it. Is Tanya an admirable person? Do you find Tanya inspiring that you would like to be like Tanya if you could? All right, Jane's story. Jane also went to college. Uh, she majored in humanities. And uh, by the time she graduated, uh, she was looking for a job. Unfortunately, the summer after she graduated, her parents both died suddenly and unexpectedly. That was sad, but not so sad was the fact that they left her $10 million in their will. 
And as soon as the will got through uh, probate and the money was in her account, she immediately took 9.9 .9 million of those dollars and gave it away to various charities, took the remaining $100,000 and put it in investments that are earning 6% per year, and she lives off the 6% per year, which is $6,000, which is a little bit below the poverty line, but you can make it on $6,000 a year if you're careful in the United States. Question, is Carly an admirable person? Is Carly someone who inspires you to live life the way she is living her life? All right, now the point of uh, these three stories is that the three young fictional women are representative of three different ethical systems, all of which have had great currency in the Western intellectual tradition. And some part of you should find yourself resonating with and saying, yeah, I can see why that person would be admirable or admirable or considered morally worthy, right, and so forth. But if we look at what's basically built into each one, young woman's right, mode of living, right, so to speak, right, Carly is a productive person. She's the entrepreneurial. She was providing service to people, and they voluntarily exchanged with her to the point where some people are judging her business to be worth $10 million. So her commitment is to producing value and trading with other people. And those can be seen as good things. Tanya, by contrast, is what we call a predator. Right? She's not actually creating $10 million worth of value. Instead, other people have created that $10 million worth of value that's stored in the financial institution. She is simply preying on their weakness at protecting their money. And so she's getting something for nothing. Right? And so she is engaging in a big win-lose right, transaction. Jane, by contrast, also is not a producer. She did not produce the $10 million worth of value. On the other hand, she's also not a taker. She's not scamming anybody out of $10 million. But what the emphasis on her life is, is on not enjoying right, the value that $10 million can bring to her life, rather on sacrificing that for the sake of other people and living as frugal as she possibly can. So Carly is a representative of what's sometimes called a self-realization ethic. Right? If you've read Aristotle, you see a lot of that there. Uh, Tanya is a representative of a predatory ethic, and Tanya is sorry, Jane is representative of a very strongly altruistic, self-sacrificial right, kind of ethic here. All right. Now. <clears throat> Let's think about the entrepreneur. What I want to argue is that business ethics, and by extension, the way people think about economic matters and business matters morally, throughout much of history has been dominated by thinking that the choice is primarily between Tanya's and Jane's. That people like Carly are very rarely mentioned in the business ethics literature, neither to be celebrated right, nor to denigrate it. If you think, for example, about you know, Bill Gates as a good example, someone who has created right, hundreds of billions of dollars right, worth of value. Uh, he himself has amassed a fortune of on the order of 50 billion and so forth. But the question is, is Bill Gates admired morally right, because he created Microsoft and created all of that value? And compare the moral adulation that uh, is directed toward him on that account or is Bill Gates to be admired because he's taking a significant amount of his money and giving it away? Do we admire people morally because they are productive, or do we admire people morally because they give money away? That is a key issue. And what I want to argue is that if we think in terms of entrepreneurship, right, the Carly mode, then we have a foundation for a more modern, I'm going to call it, approach to ethics here. Right? So what does this mean to think? All right, well, let's ask the question, why we work? Why, uh, why get a job? Why hopefully have a career, right, and so forth? What's the point of that? Now, a lot of people, sadly, say, well, I, I work because I have to. Right? It's not something that I necessarily want to do, right, but I have to do. Uh, it might, might be true, right? Unless you win the lottery or you're born into wealth, right? In some sense, you have to, right, work. Right? Making a living is a basic responsibility. But beyond this issue of just barely making a living, right. there are lots of other values that work brings to us. Right. Uh, financial security, right. creative expression, 
if you like to work with people, right, sociability. Uh, some careers are more adventuresome, right, and so forth. So there's a whole psychological dimension to our careers over and above the financial baselines of putting a roof over our head, paying for food, right, and, and so forth. But we also know that people then can, even beyond that, find their careers to be something that is deeply satisfying to them. And they start to speak in terms of mission, right, and a strong sense of their identity of who they are, right, and their careers. And so it's not a matter of on Monday mornings I have to go to work, but on Monday mornings I get to go to work. So what is this value phenomenon, right, that careers sometimes, right, can have? Now, when you uh, are thinking about your work choices, one of the other choices we face is I can go to work for someone else or I can go into business right for myself. And as recently as we know, more people are choosing entrepreneurship. But let's ask, why might people choose entrepreneurship right, as a career vehicle rather than going to work for someone else? And if you talk to people who run their own business, who start their own business, or who are thinking about it, they almost all say the same things. Right? And there are four things that they mention. One thing that they mention is wealth, the first thing on the list. You can make good money working for other people, but if you want the big bucks, you have to be in an ownership position. And entrepreneurship is one vehicle for putting yourself in an ownership position to make a large amount of money. Uh, autonomy. Entrepreneurs and people who run their own businesses, they are the deciders. They are the initiators. Right? Consequently, they have more power over what they do with a significant chunk of their work life compared to other people who work for other organizations. They then have, a, since they are the deciders and they are the initiators, a more psychic sense of ownership right, of their careers right, and what they're doing in their businesses. Their business becomes my idea right, done my way. And that autonomy is enormously valuable, as opposed to the way many people unfortunately think of their work life, and that is being a cog in someone else's machine. Right? And that is demeaning if you get to that point as well. Self-expression is another thing that entrepreneurs and business owners also mention. They build businesses from the ground up. Typically, they generate the idea. They make it happen um, <clears throat> as opposed to other people are running the show. It's other people's projects that I'm working on. I am a follower doing other things according to, according to a script that somebody else generated. So what we then have is beyond barely making a living, right, the aspiration for significant amounts of wealth, significant amounts of autonomy in our lives, significant amounts of self-expression in our lives. These are traits, or sorry, value options that entrepreneurship makes possible more than the average run-of-the-mill career. Now, there's another value right, that's built into entrepreneurship. Right? Entrepreneurs don't take stuff from other people. Right? Instead, they deal with people on a trade basis. And there's an enormous satisfaction right, when two people who have been productive right, come together and find a way to do business with each other that is beneficial to both of them. Both parties walk away from the transaction feeling that they made a good deal right, and they like what that deal is going to do for them. But they also like the experience socially of having made someone else's life better off because you know that the other party is also walking away from the deal thinking that they made a good deal. And this idea of relating to other people socially on a mutually beneficial win-win basis. Right? Uh, entrepreneurs experience that because they get into the business, so to speak, from the ground up, right, as opposed to working in large organizations where you are one of 20,000 people dealing with other organizations in personally far away, and you don't know right, how those transactions are, are working out. All right. so. That point is the first point, that entrepreneurship highlights and stresses number of human values that are important right, to human beings in the pursuit right, of, uh, of a life well lived. Now, that's to speak of entrepreneurship just as a, a value phenomenon. Right? What, what are my goals? What am I striving to su succeed? And, and uh, what career options are open to me to best maximize my chance of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of pursuing those things? But if we go inside the entrepreneurship process as well and try to figure out how it is, not what entrepreneurs are trying to accomplish, but how it is that entrepreneurs succeed right, at what they do. 
right, a number of very interesting character traits right, start to emerge. So let me just read you a paragraph here, and then I'll unpack it. As I'm reading through the paragraph, I'm just going to stress a couple of words, and those are the ones that we will come back to. But just a, a description of the process. All right, so the entrepreneurial process starts when someone has an informed, creative idea, an idea for something new. The entrepreneur is ambitious and gutsy and takes the initiative in developing the idea into a new enterprise. Through much perseverance and also trial and error, the entrepreneur produces something of value. The entrepreneur has to take on a leadership role in cons showing consumers the value of the new product or service and in showing employees how to make it. The entrepreneur then trades with other people to win-win benefit and then he or she experiences success and the realization and enjoyment of success that the venture has made. Okay, let's unpack some of that. All right, first thing, entrepreneurs right, exhibit creative knowledge, right, as opposed to people who just go to work and they do the same thing according to the recipe or according to what they're told. Entrepreneurship starts with people thinking for themselves, thinking independently and coming up with some sort of a, a new idea. Here entrepreneurs think about, talk about vision, uh, creative imagination, thinking outside the box, all of the cliches, I'm sure you've heard right, many of them. But then generating ideas is only a part of it. Entrepreneurs also have to exercise informed judgment. It's one thing to generate a dozen possible ideas. Another thing is then to figure out which of those ideas actually is operable, which ones actually are worth trying to put into practice. Uh, so there's cognitive achievement that is built into entrepreneurship playfulness intellectually, research, experimentation, analysis, judgment, and so forth. All right, next, ambition. Right? Entrepreneurs have to have ambition. Uh, it's one thing <clears throat> to uh, kind of want to have a better life, but to uh, feel that drive strongly, that is what we call ambition, to feel more strongly, uh, more than just kind of the idle, daydreaming, wouldn't it be nice if I had a billion dollars, right, or whatever, right, to feel the need to succeed at whatever your goal is that you have set for yourself. Initiative, right? It's one thing to have a good business plan or a good idea. It's another to turn the plan into reality. Entrepreneurs have to be self-starters. They have to make the commitment to take the idea and turn it into practice. Any uh, new venture, though, almost by definition, involves adventuring into the unknown. It involves risks, uh, risk of failure, risk that other people will say your idea is stupid, who will mock you. Right? So entrepreneurship requires guts. Right? The possibility that you will look bad in other people's eyes, the possibility that you will look bad in your own eyes, that you will think of yourself as a failure and so on. To take those steps, to take the risky plunge, you have to have the guts to make the leap, so to speak. Entrepreneurial success almost never is overnight. It's a very rare phenomenon. Instead, it takes a great deal of sticking with it for the long haul. In many cases, dead ends, setbacks, obstacles. Persevering through those obstacles is built into the process as well. Development process almost always is trial and error. We have to be comfortable with making lots of mistakes, learning from our mistakes, being able to admit that we made mistakes, uh, willingness to uh, trash an idea and start over. That has to be in the process as well. Rather than we know many people get an idea, they kind of put the intellectual blinders on, that's their pet idea and nothing is going to shake them right, from that pet idea. That leads to failure almost always. Productivity is the next one, right? A commitment to actually getting the job done. Uh, a lot of people can carry things through 50% mark, 60% mark, 80% mark. That final 10% is enormously challenging, actually getting the product up and running, actually opening the doors and so forth, seeing it through to completion. I know this is uh, my, one of my great failings. I have so many projects that I've got 90% done and then I just let it go, right, for whatever reason. Okay, so the finishing, right, ability here. Then finally, not finally, leadership, right, has to be there. If you're doing something new, right, you have to convince the customers, right, that it's worth their while, that it's worth their money, right? That's a leadership role. 
if you're going to start a new business and grow the business, you're going to be bringing employees in and you have to lead them and show them how to do it and how to do it to your standards, right, and so forth. Leadership of various sorts is built into the process as well. Trading, right, with other people. You have the valuable product, you put it out there. Getting in return, right, the, uh, the value that's going to make you profitable and able to uh, either enjoy those results or fold that money back into the business to grow your business. A commitment to trading for value for value. And then finally, success, right? And that experience of flourishing, that point where you know your business is working, right? you're financially successful, and all of the pride that goes with uh, knowing that you made it happen and being able to enjoy that psychically. All right, so that's a whole series of traits, but the point here is just to talk through entrepreneurship from the business outside, right? If we look at people who are successful in business, not all of them have all of those traits to the maximum degree. Everybody has a mixture of strengths and weaknesses and so forth. But if you're going to be successful in business, particularly successful as an entrepreneur, you have to have most of those traits most of the time. And you have to be aware which ones you're weak on and you have to be working on them. Or take partners right, who have uh, strengths where you have weaknesses so that your weaknesses don't draw the, the firm down, their strengths can carry you through and so forth. All right, now what does this have to do though with ethics? Right? And so what I want to do is uh, put things in a list. We're academics and that means everything eventually has to go into a table. And so here's the, the table <clears throat> and let's talk through the table. Now what I want to do, what I want to do rather is connect these business traits, right? business success, tr success traits to ethics language right? or morality language and so forth. I take this first one here. The entrepreneur's commitment to acquiring knowledge, acquiring good knowledge, validating the knowledge, creative thinking, and all of the exercise judgment, that connects to what we call rationality. Right? Rationality is a commitment to the exercise of your reason. The entrepreneur's initial active creative thinking, that's a function of reason. Evaluative judgment is an exercise of reason. Imagination is an exercise of reason. Being able to sort out things that are actually going to work from things that are not going to work, an exercise in applied reason, and so forth. And so to the extent that one is committed to rationality in its fully developed form, the more one is in a position to then have the knowledge, the robust knowledge, and the creative thinking skills that are necessary to succeed in business. The trait of ambition connects to the moral virtue of pride. Uh, pride is an enormously controversial uh, virtue, depending on what ethical tradition you're talking about. Uh, but one of the major Western ethical traditions sees pride as a positive. Pride can have a, a, a backward-looking component. You take pride in what you have accomplished. But ambition is forward-looking, and there's a forward-looking component to pride that's important here. Pride means wanting to be the best that you can be, right? taking pride in what your potential are and being committed to realizing right, your greatest potential. So for example, if you uh, say take pride in your experience, this is just a standard example, that means that you're committed to certain issues with respect to health and hygiene and style and so forth. And so you're projecting right, how you want to be if you're taking pride in your appearance. And the same thing holds here, right? Ambition in business or taking pride in your business means wanting and being committed to making your business be the best that it can possibly be. Next, initiative. Lying on the couch, having a whole bunch of ideas but never doing anything, right? as opposed to lying on the couch, having some good ideas and getting off the couch and doing something about it. That's the trait of initiative. That connects to what in moral philosophy we call integrity. Integrity means that you are integrated, right? And what's integrated is what you think with what you do, right? If you think you have a good idea, but you don't do anything about it, then that means there's a disintegration between what you think and what you actually do. So if you think it's a good idea and you act on that idea, then your actions are integrated with your thinking, right? And so people who show initiative are people of integrity. Next. Very straightforward one, guts and courage, right? Life is hard, life is challenging, lots of possibilities of failure, failure in your own eyes, failure in the eyes of others, disapproval in the eyes of others, but nonetheless, not letting the fears 
The fears that are natural and normal dominate your thinking. Do what you think you need to do uh, despite the possibility of failure in some form or other. Courage is an omnipresent point here. Perseverance is tied to a virtue of independence. That is to say, in many cases, people don't persevere because they let short-term things distract them. And so if you set yourself a goal and you remain focused, that is to say, your thinking is independent of distracting elements right, that might drag you around. Right? A person who is scatterbrained, who can't stay focused, is, so to speak, dependent on environment or external stimuli for what he or she is doing. If you have your own idea, and you're committed to that idea, then you stay focused on that. Even when you're tired, right? even when there are naysayers, right, and so forth, your judgment, your independent judgment about what you're going to do carries the day. Right? Next, honesty. Trial and error, which is built into virtually all of business, but certainly in entrepreneurship at the beginning, requires an honesty. Right? Be willing willingness to say, Maybe my idea is not such a good idea after all. Right? Even though I came up with it and I love this idea, maybe it's not actually going to work. Being able to recognize negative feedback for what it actually is and to let that focus into your thinking right, as opposed to what we know people can do, do is just block out things that they don't want to pay attention to because it goes against uh, something that they think is an important idea. Actually being committed to the facts as they really are and let that ruthless honesty drive your thinking right, is a commitment that is necessary. Uh, productivity, just the abstract noun form, is productiveness, right? uh, getting the job done, seeing it through, and seeing it through at the highest level of quality that you think is appropriate. That commitment ties into productivity. I don't know of a good uh, abstract noun for leadership. Leadership is actually fairly complicated, and uh, there's a whole network of traits that I think are, are appropriate here. I'm just going to call that network of traits leadershipness, right? And being able then and being committed to developing the traits that will make one be successful as a leader. Trading value for value connects to the concept of justice, right? people getting what they deserve. If you created something of enormous value, then you deserve. Uh, enormous value in return. If you destroyed a whole lot of value, right, then you deserve to go bankrupt, right, and so forth. If you've written an A paper, justice demands that you get the A. If you've written an F paper, justice demands that you get the F. So it's a measure of value, and people who are committed to trading value according to each person's contribution to whatever is going on, that is a commitment to the moral virtue of justice. And then finally, self-esteem, right, as the moral psychologist to talk about it, a person who feels that they are worthy, that they have accomplished something, right, important, uh, and that they're able to enjoy their success, right, that healthy self-esteem, uh, that's the moral vocabulary language for what, on the business side, we talk about experiencing and enjoying success. All right, talking through all of that right, is to say, that when we talk about ethics, right, these are the kinds of abstract traits that we say are admirable traits. Now, not all of them are admirable in every moral tradition. Some of them are quite controversial. But these are all moral virtues. And there's a very tight connection between them and what we talk about when we talk about people who are successful in business, particularly successful as entrepreneurs right, in business, right, where everything is maximized. Here we talk about the moral, here we're talking about the practical, and my first theoretical point is that moral virtue and business success properly conceived are identical. Business is one vehicle right, in which a morally virtuous life can be realized to a high degree. And I think that's the right way to put it. Now, if you think uh, historically, the lists on the right of virtues, if you read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, many of those traits, moral virtues, are stressed in Aristotle's account of the virtues. And in contemporary form, uh, the list on the right coming from Ayn Rand, if you've read Atlas Shrugged, for example, in Galt's speech, that list of virtues uh, is very similar to the list of virtues that Rand singles out. And it makes a lot of sense given that much of Rand's work celebrates right, entrepreneurial right, types of people. All right. Now, what this then means is 
uh, if we think in terms of business ethics, much of business ethics does not believe that business people can be moral. Right? That there's something about business that by its nature is amoral or actively immoral, right? depending on what moral tradition this person right, is coming out of. And so there's a very deep controversy within uh, the business ethics field right, over the basic moral status of business people. And what I want to argue is that the separation thesis, while it has dominated business ethics discourse for much of uh, the 20th century, business ethics is still a relatively young field, and this has been one of the theses that has dominated, that it's starting to give way in the last few years or so as people take entrepreneurship more seriously, study entrepreneurship, and identify the traits that are going on in successful entrepreneurship and their congruence with a, uh, a non-hostile to moral morality, rather, set of criteria. Uh, business ethics is a contradiction in terms. You've all heard that phrase, right? I'm sure that's the separation thesis, right, in cliche form. Right? But the point is, uh, if you think that what it takes to be successful in business is to be an is immoral SOB who stomps all over people, right, to get to the top, right, then naturally you're going to subscribe to the separation thesis. But if you think, by contrast, that business is about creating value, right, exhibiting good, strong character, trading with other people, value for value, then business starts to look a whole lot more moral. And that is the central argument here. All right. Next subtopic. Um, I want to put a number of phrases up here. I just ran through a whole bunch of Phrase independence, justice, integrity, rationality, self-esteem, right, and so forth. And my argument so far has been to try to highlight those as important moral concepts when we think about business. But if you think about other moral codes, particularly ones that are influential in business ethics as well, this is the sort of language that will be emphasized here. Duty, obligation, selflessness, compassion, charity, sacrifice, social responsibility, sharing, equal distribution. Now, there is a place for most of these, I think, in any healthy ethic. The interesting issue is what traits you take to be morally fundamental to business, and that's where the debate is going to be. All right. One of the reasons why we're having the controversies that we're having in business ethics right now has a lot to do with history. Western civilization really is an unusual civilization, historically speaking. Most moral culture, or most cultures rather, through all of history, anywhere in the world, are what I call monocultures. That is to say, everybody in that culture is pretty much on the same page about all of the important issues. They basically agree on politics, they basically agree on religion, they basically agree on morality, they basically agree on family structure, and so forth. Western culture is not like that. What we call modern Western culture draws on many different earlier cultures and tries to form a hybrid right, out of them. And not all of the elements of those earlier moral cultures fit together very well. If you take your standard Western Civ course, the two cultures that typically get singled out the most are the Greco-Roman tradition. We get an enormous amount from the Greeks, an enormous amount from the Greeks. Uh, for the Romans, but also then the, the, uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition. Right? We get an enormous amount of our modern inheritance from that tradition as well. And if you just take the Greco-Roman tradition and the Judeo-Christian tradition and you look at their philosophies, you look at their approaches to politics, you look at their moral codes, which are of my central interest here, there's not a very easy fit between those. But nonetheless, in the modern world, we try to jam them together into one package, and we call that modern Western civilization. But at the same time, we are living in extraordinarily revolutionary times. Right? We, uh, in historical times, two centuries is nothing. But in two centuries, we have revolutionized our politics. We have revolutionized science. We have revolutionized our economic way of doing things. Many of the basic fundamentals of uh, small-scale business are pretty much the same, but most business people from 500 years ago would not recognize the modern business world that we live in and take for granted. And the same thing holds for moral codes. Right? As moral codes evolve much more slowly right, than the business world has evolved, that's exacerbated the various debates right, and so forth. So if we think, for example, uh, corporations, right? For many people, corporation is a very powerful, successful uh, 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 form of doing business. 
and it's one that should be emulated, and, and one of the big goals is to incorporate yourself so you can uh, achieve certain things. For many other people, corp uh, corporation is a dirty word. Right? By definition, corporations are just immoral monsters destroying everything. Profit is a measure of success, but then for other people, profit is a dirty word. Competition is a good thing. It makes us strive to be better, right? It produces the quality and quantity and lowers prices and so forth, so it's good for everyone all around. Other moral traditions will say competition is a bad thing. It brings out the worst of people, right, and so forth. The point is that we live in a very polarized moral culture. And what I want to argue is that our evolution in our moral discussion has not kept pace with our very rapid, not evolution, but rather revolution in economics and business. So there's some catching up that's been necessary to do. Let me give you some examples here. If you think of human history, anthropologists will typically say that human beings have been around for about 200,000 years. That's an unimaginable stretch of time. 200 years, the last uh, two centuries, extraordinarily revolutionary comprise less than one-tenth of one percent of all of human history. Right? But if you look at all of human history, you ask, who have been the heroes? Right? Who have been the role models? Who have been the kinds of individuals who have been idolized, revered, seen as moral exemplars, right? the ones to look at? Right? And I want to uh, make the assertion that there are two dominant role models and heroes, moral heroes who have been upheld out through most of history and most of culture. Here's the first one. Okay. A little bit antiquated right from our perspective here. But the idea is the best person, the person who's living the ideal life, the life that anyone should aspire to if one is able to, is the person who is at the top of the tribal ladder or the top of the feudal hierarchy. That is to say, you are a noble or you are an aristocrat. And what is the job description of a noble aristocrat? Well, it is to prepare for war, to engage in martial activities, to learn swordsmanship, to learn horsemanship, to learn how to fight, right, to learn strategy, so as to be able to conquer other people and take their stuff and make them do what you want to do. That's the best life possible. That, that's admirable, right? Conquest and domination. Now, this is a, a Western version, but we find it in the same thing in the samurai version, and almost all major civilizations have developed, have developed an aristocratic class that enshrines martial virtues as the dominant ones. So, you still have to make a living, right? you still have to eat, somebody has to make your weapons, right? somebody has to put clothes on your back, build your castle, right? till your fields, right? and so forth. So somebody has to attend to business and the economic way of life, but who is that? Well, that's the peasants, that's the tradesmen. And from the aristocratic perspective, you look down on those people. Right? Those people are beneath your station. Right? Working and creating value and doing things in business is not moral. Right? It's something that people have to do, but it's for a lower order of person to do. People who are admirable don't work with their hands. Right? They don't make stuff. They don't deal with money. Right? They are above all of that. Right? And that is a cultural tradition that is built into almost every major culture for not just hundreds of years or thousands of years, but multiples of tens of thousands of years. Very deeply ingrained and even so on into the modern world. All right, a uh, little sidebar here. Interestingly, uh, this is a European and a Japanese, but one of the issues that happened uh, right here in America with the, uh, the Plains Indians, and one of the reasons why when the European settlers came, uh, the relationships were in many cases very bad with the, the domestic input, that there was no assimilation possible, largely because, not largely, but significantly because, from the American Indians' perspective, assimilating with what the Europeans wanted to do meant becoming farmers and becoming shopkeepers. And that was just degrading to them. If you are a manly man, right, you are a warrior. Right? You don't trade with people. You don't grow crops and harvest them. Maybe women do some of that sort of stuff. But a man is someone who is strong, able to dominate, and if he wants something, he takes it. He doesn't make and trade. Right? And that led to, obviously, lots of conflicts right, and wealth. 
Or if you think from the female version, where we're emphasizing guys here, if you're an aristocratic lady, right, one measure of your being at the top of the heap is that you don't have to do work. Right? You have very fine, soft hands. Right? Uh, you get carried around in a palanquin. You read poetry and flowers. Work is something that the peasants do. It's something that the servants do. It's of a lower order. Right? So the idea that business and economic work is low, deeply ingrained. All right. The second dominant code, and here are your texts if you are a modern is what I call a monkish code, right? or a monastic code. Almost all major cultures and civilizations have also developed a variation on this one here. And the idea here is that the best people, the most morally admirable people, what they do is they devote themselves to a life of spiritual values, and they disdain the physical world. They don't pay attention to their bodily and physical concerns right, very much. This is formalized in the vows that nuns and monks will take. They vow poverty, chastity, and obedience. All of those involve a deep commitment to renouncing, giving up, sacrificing material and physical values. Poverty means wealth is to be looked down upon. A moral person is not interested in money. Chastity means physical pleasure, particularly sexual pleasure, is something to be looked down upon. A spiritual, moral person right, withdraws from that. Obedience means not doing what you want, or doing what your own will, instead putting yourself in a hierarchy and following orders. So the moral person is someone who renounces, who sacrifices, right? not someone who creates material value and enjoys the fruits of their material value. All right. Now, of course, monks and nuns still need to eat. Uh, they still need to be protected from the elements, right, and so forth. And in the strongest case, the re idea here was that, again, the tradesmen and the peasants would create the food and all of the material goods and give those to the monks and nuns in the forms of charitable alms. It's not a trade transaction. It is charity. But again, built into this tradition is the idea that working uh, in the material worm, dealing with money, physical values, and so forth, is something of a lower right, moral order. OK. Now, in the modern world, things started to change a little bit. Uh, the monk code, economic work is low. You live off of charity. Warrior code, economic work is low. You live off of conquest. Right? No productivity, right? no money, no trade, no honor moral honor attached to those activities as well. In the modern world, uh, things did start to change, 1500s, 1600s, right, increasingly so. Here, economic work did start to uh, attain some dignity. Uh, but if we think, for example, of uh, what's sometimes called the Protestant work ethic, right, the idea here is that you can be an honorable person if you engage in the business life, but you have to see your business life as a duty, as a responsibility, to be an upright citizen, to provide for your family. It's not necessarily something that you want to do, but nonetheless, if you do it and you do it responsibly, then some measure of honor right, can be accorded to you. And so a middle class with these bourgeois values did start to emerge. Benjamin Franklin's autobiography and Poor Richard's Almanac are kind of historical monuments to this way of thinking. This is in the 1700s. We can think things starting to change right, significantly here. Now, all of that, I think, is fine and interesting, but I still think it's missing a significant amount. Everything so far is completely inadequate to explain the great pleasure that people can take in their work, right? the passion right, with which people can pursue their business careers, the excitement right, that the business world generates with all of those best-selling magazines about all of the cool, innovative stuff that's going on in the business world especially in the modern world. One of the great achievements, I think, of capitalism has been the unbelievable expansion of the number of careers available to young people to find just their thing that's going to do it for them and make their work not a drudgery, but something that's exciting for them to pursue. And then, of course, the encouragement that we give, if you don't like any of the available jobs out there, well, make up your own and go entrepreneurial. If you think in 2012, now, just go back 100 years, the number of jobs that were open to young men right, of your age upon college graduation, 
a few hundred careers that are possible. Now the list is potentially indefinite. Young women, 100 years ago, the number of careers that you were legitimately able to look forward to, less than 10. Right? Now the list, again, is potentially indefinite. There's that sheer expansion and the excitement then that a career brings. A career is something that you can find meaning in and that the big question is, what do I really want to be when I grow up? That's a meaningful question in the 20th century and in the 21st century. That was not a question before the 20th century. You did what you had to do. You did what you were told to do, right, so to speak. All right, I want to give you one example of that. These are famous people, right, in our culture and admired people, right, in our culture. Maybe those two don't do it for you, but maybe these two do. Everybody knows, this is a sign of the changing time, who Steve Jobs is, who Bill Gates is, who Martha Stewart is, who Oprah Winfrey is. And they're all American success stories. How many people can name our top Marshall person? Even though we're involved in wars in various places in the world, who's our top military people? Name four of them. Who are our top religiously dedicated people in the United States? Who are the role models there? And that's the point. We are in a sea change time. Right? Our cultural mores are changing. Who are our top cultural icons? Dramatically different. It's entrepreneurs who are rising to the fore here. OK, how much time do I have left, Ed? Let me ask the boss. OK. I want to make then quickly one other point. So far, I've made two points tonight. One is that I think if we take entrepreneurship seriously, that we can then connect business practice to ethics positively and organically. Right? Entrepreneurial approaches to ethics uh, build moral virtue into them. Right? And if we study entrepreneurship, then I think that's a much more healthy right, approach, as opposed to a traditional separation thesis that sees business as kind of amoral or immoral and morality as something that has to be grafted on or that we use morality to stop business people right, in various ways. The second thing is that Focusing on entrepreneurship lets us focus on creativity and productivity and trade right, as central to business ethics. And the point there was a historical point that creativity and productivity and trade were never talked about in traditional moral theories. Traditional moral theories were about conquest and domination, or they were about alms and renunciation of material value. And that's an important historical shift, ethically speaking. And I want to uh, bring things a little bit more up to date by contrasting what I'm calling entrepreneurial approaches to ethics with the dominant model of business ethics for the last mm, 50 years, as long as business ethics has been around, called corporate social responsibility. Now, the three words that are chosen here kind of indicate what's important to corporate or social responsibility. Right? They say, in the first place, corporations should be our model. The second says that the social is our focus. And the third says we should be responsible. But if we ask them, what does it mean to be responsible? It says two things, typically. Avoid harming other people and give money to other people. That's what responsibility entails. And I know I'm running short on time, so let me just say three things to think about. If we think entrepreneurially, right, that means we shouldn't be focusing primarily on corporations. And I will give you some statistics. If you look at the 27 million businesses that exist in the United States, according to the 2011 U.S. Census, 75% of them are unincorporated. 75% are unincorporated. So any business ethics model that says we should focus on business ethics by looking at corporations and what corporations do is missing three quarters of business activity. And that's bad for a theory. Right? There are lots of other business forms available, sole proprietorships, partnerships, joint ventures, right, and so forth. Right? If we're going to be doing business ethics in a proper way, we have to take awareness of all of the facts on the ground. And the truth is that most businesses are entrepreneurial or very close to their entrepreneurial roots. And so that's a much broader place to start. Um, and I've mentioned the declining right, number of people who are working at large corporations. 
Now, it's true that at corporations, because of their size, the very successful ones have a large economic impact. And that's certainly something to be taken into account of. But the economic impact of all those corporations, the top 500, was still only about the same amount as all of the other businesses right, put together. So uh, the social. Uh, entrepreneurship is social, but it is derivatively social. Every business starts with an individual right, who has an idea. Every business activity starts with someone who decides to do it, and that's an individual. I wake up in the morning, I get out of bed, I go to work, I make a hundred or so decisions, I perform all these particular actions. It's individuals who do things. Now we do a lot of things socially, and hopefully we are doing things socially in a way that is mutually beneficial to all of the individuals involved. And if it's not mutually beneficial, then we go our separate ways. But we don't form social organizations for their own sake. We form social organizations so that the individuals involved can benefit. Individuals are the doers. Individuals are the beneficiaries. Much of corporate social responsibilities assumes that in some sense we're all servants of society or that we have to get permission from society to live our lives and pursue our careers. And I don't think that is the appropriate performance. The third point here about avoiding harm to others, of course, right? When you're doing your business, you respect other people's legitimate interests, you respect their legitimate rights, you don't damage them, right? And so forth, that's part of it. Maybe after you've been successful, right, you engage in philanthropic activities here. But I think this misses the most important responsibility, right, of business, which is to make a living, to be productive, to be creative, to add value to the world. That is the first and foremost thing. What you do with the wealth after you have created value in the world, that's a follow-up question. But starting by saying that really all we're doing is not harming other people is to miss, or not primarily about not harming other people, we're about creating value, getting stuff done right in the world. It's like if I'm going to travel from New York to Los Angeles, right, my goal is to figure out how successfully to get to Los Angeles. My goal primarily is not how to avoid harming people in Nebraska along the way. Of course, you don't harm people in Nebraska along the way, but that's not what getting to Los Angeles is about. Right? Business is about production, not, not harming. Distribution, well, before there can be anything distributed, first there has to be production. There has to be something to distribute. And that means there's a logical priority to creativity and productivity. So what I want to suggest then is that corporate social responsibility is uh, not a fruitful model. If we start with entrepreneurship, then we're starting with entrepreneurial startups, not mature corporations. We're starting with individuals, and we're starting with activities that really emphasize creativity, productivity, and getting the job done. And I think that's a better place to start. All right, a couple more just quick points here in closing. I've mentioned uh, moral responsibility, some ethical theory points. This is my real point here. Yeah. I think approaching business ethics through an entrepreneurial lens is theoretically fruitful. And so I urge people who have theoretical interest in business ethics to think about entrepreneurship more seriously. I think also as the economists are doing, trying to work entrepreneurs into their model and recasting much of entrepreneurship, I think that is going to change dramatically how the economics profession looks over the course of the next 20 or 30 years. But I think this is the, really the more important point for us as individuals, particularly uh, young people. Right? You've got your whole careers ahead of you. You're going to spend more time working than you're going to spend with your friends, with your families, right, and engaging in leisure activities. Right? If you just think about the average work week, you get up, you have an hour at home, maybe with your family, then you are at work eight or ten hours, right? and then you're home maybe with your families for a few more hours or doing other activities, then you've got to sleep. That's a lot of hours. When you're thinking about how you're going to fill up your work life, make sure it is something that is metaphorically right, sexy. Now, I think there's cultural antecedents here. Right? This is uh, Startup Magazine, Fast Company Magazine, two very fast growing. Right? And the point that they are making is work is not a drudge. Work is not a duty. Work is not something that you have to do right, in that negative sense. Work can and should be, if it's your work right, done your way, and if it's your thing, can be a great source of value, right, inspiration, energizing. Right? Things that turn people into old people long before their time is working day in, day out at something they don't really want to do. I know I'm turning into an old person. 
And maybe you're skeptical just because I'm an old person. But old people do know right, some things. So uh, make sure right, when you're making that choices right, that it really is the sexy choice, however you define sexy here. So what I would recommend is uh, read about entrepreneurs. You might not want to be an entrepreneur, but you might find you are inspired. And whatever carries, uh, you get inspired carries over to whatever career that you end up doing. Even if you don't decide to become an entrepreneur, chances are very good that you are going to be working for an entrepreneurial organization. That is the trend. And entrepreneurial organizations are looking for entrepreneurial people. So figure out what makes entrepreneurial people tick. And you are a work in progress, you young people. Right? See yourself, uh, think of yourself rather in terms of how you need to shape and change and tweak yourself in a way to make yourself as entrepreneurial as possible to maximize your values in life. Now, I'm a philosopher, as uh, Ed mentioned, and philosophers are allowed to talk about the meaning of life. So I want to say entrepreneurial approaches to business are part of it. But think of your whole life, I would say, the way an entrepreneur thinks of it. Your ideas done your way, passionately, perseveringly, and seeing it through to the highest standards of quality you can set. Now, I mentioned Steve Jobs earlier. He died a year ago this month. I'll give him the last word. because He's talking about business, but what he says really is more broadly the meaning of life. Your work is going to be, or fill rather, a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know it when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking until you find it. Find it. Don't settle." End, quote. End of talk. Thank you. All right, do we have time for questions? Oh, perfect. Okay, so I'll field yeah, 